In the ancient world, rulers worshipped as gods sent out great armies to create great empires. These emperors changed the course of history by conquering country after country. One tiny nation conquered again and again was the Israelites. Perhaps no people in history were more likely to be forgotten. But these were not just any people. These were the people of the book. The people of Abraham, the first to encounter the one true God. Of Moses, the only human being to see God face to face. And of David, warrior, king, and adulterer. The Israelite stories taught unique lessons about God. And in the hands of great rabbis like Hillel and preachers like Jesus of Nazareth, the Israelites' Bible would change how human beings understood what was right and what was wrong and how they should treat one another. And against all odds, the Israelites would change human history as much as any empire that ever existed. In the fourth century BC, a remarkable people invaded the Middle East. They were the Greeks. Led by one of the greatest generals in history, Alexander the Great, the Greeks would conquer the world from Greece to India. But there was far more to the Greeks than military prowess. The Greeks had created the most sophisticated civilization the world had ever seen. Their magnificent art was inspired by a reverence for the human body, which also found its expression in the athletic feats on display in their Olympic Games. But the Greeks also revered the mind. And their greatest thinkers were responsible for the flowering of philosophy, science, and mathematics. As a result, Hellenic architecture, politics, and economics were centuries ahead of the other peoples of the world. For the Jews, the takeover of most of the known world by the Greeks was a threat more dire than any a mere army could pose. When the Greek world expanded ever eastward, ultimately the Jews of the land of Israel found themselves almost literally smack in the middle of the Hellenistic Empire. We were surrounded by Hellenistic culture and willy-nilly, we found ourselves becoming Hellenists. This triggered both a great advance and a great struggle within the Jewish people for how we would identify. Would we simply succumb to Hellenism, or would we somehow maintain our unique identity as a people? The Greeks brought brilliant innovations to Judea that would completely transform daily life. For thousands of years, the people of the Middle East had survived through barter. But the Greeks encouraged the widespread use of money. Suddenly, merchants throughout the region could sell their goods to anyone, anywhere. Economically, the world was now open. People start leaving their villages, leaving their towns, uh, for the first time in world history, we're going to find large numbers of people moving more than 20 or 30 miles from their village. And Jews were no different from others. This, I think, was the great innovation of the Hellenistic world, the mass movement. Greek culture offered Jews exciting new opportunities. 
the many farmers who produced olive oil could now sell their oil in cities from Alexandria to Athens. As this trade flourished, Jewish communities were established in cities throughout the Greek Empire. And new Greek cities were built in Judea. But as the Greek influence in Jewish life grew, more and more Jews worried that their own culture was about to be crushed. We can understand how the ancient Jews regarded Hellenism uh, simply by reminding ourselves how traditional societies around the world have regarded the coming of American culture, movies, Western styles of dress, Western technology. In our own times, we have seen how violently uh, the more traditional elements of Islam and Judaism and Christianity have regarded the materialistic, secular culture of the Western world. As this remarkable new culture swept from its cradle in Greece across the Middle East, devout Jews faced a monumental challenge. How could Judaism, with its focus simply on being good, compete with the vibrant and exciting way of life the Greeks had to offer? In 63 BC, the Roman general Pompey led his legions into the land of Judea. For 100 years, Judea had been an independent nation, and many Jews believed that as the chosen people of the one true God, they would remain free forever. But it soon became clear that the world's greatest empire could not be resisted. The triumph of the Romans produced a crisis of faith among the Jews. For some, the only explanation was that the final battle between good and evil, the end of days, was at hand. They would soon see evidence for their belief, for the years ahead in Judea would be one of the most bloody and chaotic periods in human history. This is a story of terrorists and political assassination of brutal overlords who crucified thousands, and of the siege of Jerusalem with over a hundred thousand people trapped inside. But it is also the story of how amid the chaos, two new religions began to flower, religions that would change mankind's ideas about justice, mercy, and God. Roman troops rushed into Jerusalem, the capital of Judea. They were unaware that they were about to meet the most extraordinary people they had ever tried to conquer. The defenders of the city retreated not to a fortress, but to the temple of their unique God to make their last stand. According to the historian Josephus, when the Romans attacked the temple, their commander, Pompey, was amazed by the behavior of the Jewish priests. Pompey could not but admire that they did not at all intermit their religious services, even when the temple was being attacked on all sides. Nor indeed, even when the temple was actually being taken, did they leave off the divine worship that was appointed by their law. For the temple priests, performing the rituals that honored their God was more important than life itself. For centuries, reports that the Jews believed there was only one God in the universe had fascinated the other peoples of the ancient world. And the Jews' temple in Jerusalem was famous far and wide 
for the amazing rituals the priests performed to worship their god. The Roman general Pompey was among those who was intrigued by the Jews' unusual religion. He was particularly curious to see what their mysterious god looked like. According to Josephus, as soon as the Roman general gained control of the city, he went inside the temple in search of its most sacred sanctum, the Holy of Holies, where the god of the Jews was reputed to live. There was nothing that affected the nation in all the calamities that they were under as that their holy place, which had hitherto been seen by none, should be laid open to strangers. For Pompey went whither it was not lawful any to enter but the high priest himself. Instead of the great statue of marble or bronze that he expected, Pompey saw nothing. According to the Jews, their god was so great that he could not be captured by an idol or any other man-made image. He was without form, timeless, and present everywhere. To Romans like Pompey, it was incomprehensible that the Jews would be so dedicated to the worship of a single god. Like the rest of the ancient world, the Romans had a huge pantheon of gods, but their most deeply held belief was that might made right. That conviction had won the Romans control of an enormous empire. To them, Judea was only a tiny piece in a great strategic puzzle. They needed to conquer Judea in order to gain easy access to Egypt. But to the Jews, Judea was the promised land given to them by God to be theirs alone. This clash of cultures between the Romans and the Jews would lead to a vicious and bloody conflict that would last 200 years. Even worse for the Jewish people, it was a conflict that would pit Jew against Jew as never before. The Romans come into power and it stimulates an immediate debate among the Jews about whether to revolt against them or not to revolt. And effectively, from the very beginning, there were group, Jewish groups that basically wanted to revolt and others which cautioned and said, well, we really don't need to go so far. So what happens is that these groups are vying with one another constantly in the period of Roman rule. With the rebels determined to revolt and other Jews convinced that it would be insane to rebel against Rome, the people of Jerusalem could hardly have been more divided. Then the Roman governor did the only thing that could possibly unite them. He ordered an attack on the temple. In 67 AD, Roman soldiers burst through the gates of Herod's temple, bent on plundering it. The governor was eager to steal the vast treasures of God which he held and his soldiers killed all those they came upon as they forced their way in. Outraged at the attack on the seat of God on earth, rebels and non-rebels alike united to repel the assault. Then, in a fury, they overwhelmed the small Roman garrison stationed in Jerusalem and forced it to flee the city. With Jerusalem suddenly free of Romans, many in the city were seized by a giddy euphoria. The zealots' dream of an independent Judea seemed tantalizingly within their grasp. But others argued 
that more fighting could only lead to catastrophe. A follower of Hillel named Yohanan ben Zakai was one of the most passionate voices for peace. At the risk of being targeted by the zealots for assassination, Yohanan told his students that it didn't matter who ruled Judea. What mattered was who ruled in their hearts. He argued that what truly pleased the Almighty was not zealotry at all, but something far simpler. The acts of mercy and compassion they showed to those around them. It seems that Yochanan ben Zakkai was part of the peace party. As far as we can see, there were numerous Jews who either because of their own closeness to the Romans, whether business reasons or other reasons, or simply because they were absolutely convinced there was no hope to do such a crazy thing as revolt against Rome, many Jews were really against the revolt. It seems that Yochanan ben Zakkai was one of those types of Jews who felt that what needed to be done was to get some form of accommodation from the Romans that would guarantee Jewish religious freedom and then leave things as they were with Roman rulers. But Jerusalem was not yet ready for Yohanan's vision of Judaism. From the steps of the temple, the zealots made a public declaration of war against Rome. Convinced they were mad, many other Jews decided to take up arms to stop the zealots. Fighting at this point broke out between those uh, Jews and the rebellious Jews who had uh, taken refuge among them, and it was house to house at some point. Different neighborhoods would belong to one party or the other party, and the streets ran with blood. After a vicious week-long civil war, the zealots were victorious. They celebrated their victory by setting the city on fire. The zealots set fire to the high priest's home and the palaces. Then they carried the fire to the place where the records were kept and burned the contracts it held, thereby dissolving all of their debts. This was also done that they might persuade the multitude of the poor who were debtors to join in their insurrection. News of the zealots' uprising against Rome soon reached the nearby city of Caesarea. Outraged, Romans and Syrians in Caesarea massacred thousands of their Jewish neighbors. In revenge, Jews throughout Judea began killing Syrians and Romans living among them. It was common to see cities filled with bodies, still lying unburied, and those of old men mixed with women and infants, all dead. The whole region was full of inexpressible calamities, while the fear was everywhere that there were even more barbarous times to come. Romans were determined to crush the rebellion before it inspired others in their far-flung empire to challenge their rule. They dispatched their greatest general, Vespasian, into Judea to lead an army of over 60,000 men. Vespasian marched to the city of Gadara and quickly took it, for he found it destitute of any men fit for war. He then killed all the children. The Romans having no mercy on any age whatever. And this was done out of the hatred they bore the rebels. As news of Vespasian's atrocities swept through Judea, Jews throughout the region began fleeing before his army toward Jerusalem. When the Roman army finally reached the city, Josephus estimated that more than 100,000 people were trapped inside its walls. The 
Romans set up their camps in full view of the city in the hope that the mere sight of their military might would convince the people of Jerusalem to surrender. Their force was composed of three battle-hardened legions drawn from garrisons in Rome, Egypt, and Syria. They were armed with catapults, battering rams, siege engines, the fearsome weapons of war that had helped them conquer the world from England to Persia. But conquering Jerusalem was still a daunting challenge. The city was surrounded by not one, but three walls, which together were nearly 60 feet thick. And in the center of the city, the temple with its own massive walls and towers loomed as one of the most formidable fortresses in the world. But behind those walls, there was chaos. The city of Jerusalem during the revolt was, of course, under complete siege. Food and water were not entering, and inside, all the normal governmental institutions had broken down. They were maintaining temple sacrifice, but outside of the temple, there were all of these rebel armies. Actually, you know, there were about six that were controlling different quarters of the city and whose commanders were fighting over what to do. So you had really anarchy and fear and, as Josephus describes it, tremendous starvation. Inside the city, the catastrophe foretold by Yohanan ben Zakkai was coming to pass. The zealots had begun fighting among themselves for control of Jerusalem. And when one band of zealots broke into the territory of another, they would inflict the worst damage they could think of, burning their rivals' food supply. They set on fire those houses that were full of grain and all the other provisions. And as soon as they were forced into a retreat, the same thing was done to them by the others. Accordingly, it came to pass that almost all the grain in the city was burned, which would have been sufficient to survive a siege of many years. With the food supply decimated, Many decided their only hope was to flee Jerusalem. But the zealots believed God wanted the entire nation to confront the Romans as one. They issued an edict that anyone who tried to leave would be considered a traitor and executed. It's in many ways like the, the militarists within any society in our own time, um, those that, that are um, following a military uh, mode in terms of the Islamic Jihad or in terms of, um, mil of those that we saw in Bosnia. Um, in other words, those that, that, may, that decide that the only way to work is through military means. Um, and that was a scary time for all Jews in Jerusalem at that time because most of them were not zealots. As the siege wore on, the situation inside Jerusalem grew more and more desperate. Of those who perished by famine, the number was great, and the miseries they underwent were unspeakable. For if so much as the shadow of any kind of food did anywhere appear, a war began, and the dearest friends fell to fighting one with another about it. Soon, many people became so desperate that they were willing to risk death at the hands of the zealots. And so, they would creep out little-known doorways and gates to the city and gather weeds to eat. But outside the city walls, they risked capture and incredibly brutal treatment at the hands of the Roman legionnaires. The Nazi Holocaust of the 20th century has seemed to be a, an endless stream of ghastly stories, fiendish stories of, uh, of, of cruelty that seems to defy uh, the human imagination. But there's an, 
an appalling stream of such stories from, from this Holocaust as well. Uh, for example, as people began to attempt to leave the besieged city uh, secretly, uh, when they were captured, uh, mercenaries working for uh, Rome would disembowel them, thinking that they might have swallowed gold or, uh, or jewels and that they were hoping then to you know, recover these uh, after they defecated them later on. This is a, not a strange or unusual practice in the, uh, on the part of people fleeing during time of war. Guessing that this might have happened, they literally eviscerated these people uh, looking for the occasional ruby or, or gold coin. <laughs> The Romans also took many of the men, women, and children they captured and crucified them. At the time of the siege of Jerusalem, thousands were crucified. The historian Josephus says that the hills around the city were deforested. So many trees were chopped down to make crosses on which to crucify Jews. Josephus also describes what I would call terror crucifixions. The city was still under siege, still holding out against the Romans, but crosses were erected on the hillsides around it so that the people inside could see what awaited them if they continued their resistance. Forced to choose between torture at the hands of the Romans or starvation at the hands of the Zealots, the people of Jerusalem were in complete despair. A deep silence and a kind of deadly night seized upon the city. Those that were distressed by the famine were desirous to die, and those already dead were thought happy. It was the last chance for anyone hoping to escape alive. And yet, it was only the decaying bodies of the dead that the zealots would allow to leave. Then, late one night, a procession approached a city gate. It was a group of students carrying the body of Yohanan ben Zakai who had advocated peace instead of war. According to the Jewish book of tradition and law, the Talmud, the zealots were suspicious. Some of the guards asked, who is this? The disciples answered, a dead body. Don't you know that dead bodies may not be kept in Jerusalem overnight? Then one of the zealots decided to drive a dagger through the body. But one of the disciples restrained him by saying, do you want to be remembered as the man who pierced the body of the master? So they opened the gate for the beer and it left the city. The student's trick had worked. Outside the gate, Yohanan sprang up alive from the beer, on which he had been surrounded by rotting meat. Then he hurried away from Jerusalem. Yohanan was convinced the starving rebels could no longer defend the city or the temple. And he had decided that the very survival of Judaism was on his shoulders. After a four-month siege, Rome's legions finally broke through the first wall of the city. The zealots rushed to meet them and fought with tremendous bravery. But they could not prevent the Romans from fighting their way to the heart of the city, the temple. 
The Romans proceeded as far as the Holy House itself. Then one of them set fire to it. Now the Jews suffered nothing to restrain their force, nor tried to save their lives, since their holy house was perishing. The temple, the only place on earth according to the Bible where God could be worshipped, was laid to waste by the Romans. As for a great part of the people, they were weak and without arms, and had their throats cut wherever they were caught. In the temple around the altar lay dead bodies heaped one upon another, and at the steps going up to it ran a great quantity of their blood. In the history of the world, no nation has ever suffered such a calamity. The destruction of the temple in the year 70 was the greatest catastrophe and trauma to happen to the Jewish people, I would argue, until our own time in the Holocaust. It was the center of the economic life of the Jewish people, as if the Federal Reserve was housed in the temple. It was the center of the judicial life. The Supreme Court was housed in the temple. It was the center of the religious life, as if the high priest was the chief rabbi centered in that building. And in a matter of hours, it was gone. When the temple was destroyed, everything was gone. There was no other branch of government because it was all invested in the priesthood and the high priest and the temple. With the seat of God on earth in ruins, the religion of the priests and their rituals was lost forever. How would Judaism and the Jews survive?